I'm going to start asking, what is the purpose of these days? Why do we keep them? Well, God tells us to keep them, but why, why does God tell us to keep these days? I think he wants us to keep these holy days because he wants us to remember him, and we want, he wants us to remember his plan. There are several major events that were fulfilled by these days. You've got the Exodus, you've got Israel entering the Promised Land, and you've got Jesus' death and resurrection. Each event represents a progression in God's plan. And each of these events have symbolic meanings beyond just their stories. Deeper meanings that are discussed throughout the New Testament. You also have the symbolism of the the unleavened bread itself. This feast tends to be viewed as just like an Old Testament thing. But the symbology of leaven and unleavened bread is dealt with almost more in the New Testament than the Old Testament. Jesus warns his disciples, beware of the leaven or the sin of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In the Mark account, he says to beware of the leaven of Herod. Paul uses this analogy of leaven to warn the Corinthian church against allowing sin to enter within the congregation. Let's turn to that. That's how Ray started today, and that's how I'll start as well. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Leif also gave a a whole sermonette on this set of scriptures on the first day. To me, this is probably the most important scripture for us as Christians in keeping these days of unleavened bread. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He says, let us keep the feast. Who is he telling this to? He's telling this to the Corinthian church, which would have been made up probably primarily of Gentiles. But they were keeping the feast. And he's telling them to be unleavened, unleavened like Jesus Christ, and to live in sincerity and truth. But now we've kind of reached the end of these days. And you can kind of feel this sense of, well, now what? And that's actually the title of my message today. And, and it really points to tonight at sunset. The days of unleavened bread are over. Now what? The last day of unleavened bread really isn't mentioned that much in the Bible. You could make a case, like, like uh, Ray was saying, that the Red Sea crossing could have occurred on it. It's, it's at least in the whereabouts of that event. You could make a case that the walls of Jericho fell on it. Again, it, it's got to be very close if it's not on this day. Well, after the Red Sea... The Israelites definitely had this now what state. There was no food, there was no water, and they were traveling through this desolate land to to a land they had never been. And they complained. They complained a lot. And God heard their complaints, and he provided for them. He provided manna. God provided water through a variety of different miracles. But if you think about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, they never got past that now once state. 
They were always in that now what state for the next 40 years. And that particular generation really serves as a model of what we should not be doing. In the New Testament, after Jesus' death, the disciples were a bit of lost sheep themselves. Yes, it was thrilling when they saw that Jesus Christ was resurrected. He was alive. It was a, a, a miracle. But after that, they didn't know what to do. Peter said, I'm going fishing. <laughs> and the rest of the disciples said, we're going with you. It wasn't until Jesus Christ redirected them by coming back to them and saying, Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep, that they, they really got a sense of some sort of mission. And at Pentecost, that mesh, mission was, was truly revealed to them at that point. And they seemed to be hit the ground running after that. In the Joshua account, Israel also had a now what moment after the days of one bread. They had just conquered Jericho, and they were getting ready to take the promised land. Jericho would have really represented probably one of the pinnacle moments for this generation. But it was immediately followed by probably their very lowest moment. Finding direction is an important aspect to these days. The days of Lumbred in, in God's calendar occur in the first month. It's the beginning of the new year. And part of the purpose of these days is to set a direction for our lives. It's a good opportunity to assess our lives, our goals, and our vision for the next coming year. God gives us tools to help us in creating this new baseline for this next year. We're to look at our lives through introspection and correct issues as we see it. And we're to break sinful patterns. That provides a good start for this next year. But our lives are, are, are not just about not sinning. We need to replace those old patterns with new ones, better ones. And establishing these new patterns is an important aspect to these days. I think it was two Sabbaths ago, Kurt gave a sermonette on Genesis 1, verse 1. And he called the statement in Genesis 1, verse 1, a summary statement. In the beginning, God created or made the heavens and the earth. There's a lot more to creation than just this, but it summarizes the major aspect of what had happened. These summary statements can begin a story. They can conclude a story. When people die, they, there's, also, there's usually a summary asso uh, statement associated with their death called an obituary, and their loved ones are set out to, to write this summary statement for that person. There's a lot more to that person's life than just that paragraph or that, that set of paragraphs, but it hits all the major aspects of that person's life. Coming out of the days of Lombred, it's a good time to consider our own summary statement. It seems maybe a little morbid, but it's important to consider all the main points of our life. And if we're, if we're doing what we want, if that summary statement is what we want it to be. Part of 
part of my goal of my sermon today is to put ourselves in the place. Put ourselves in the place of Israel right after they conquer Jericho in that in that those next few weeks what they were feeling what they were dealing with because there's a story there and in some ways it's kind of a hidden story but there's much to learn from it before we go to that story let's turn to Joshua 24 verse 31 This is the summary, summary, uh, summary statement for this generation of Israelites. Joshua 24, verse 31. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. This is the kind of summary statement we should all be striving for. I think it's easy to miss the success of this generation because the story actually of, of these Israelites is, is sometimes tough for us. You kind of get caught up in like the death that occurred, the genocide that occurred by them taking this land. And I don't think it was easy for them to, to go through that process. There are several occasions through the story where they exhibited more mercy than really God wanted them to, where they made peace with nations that they shouldn't have, where they didn't keep, kill people that God said, no, you need to take care of them because they're going to cause problems in the future. The key point about this generation is they served God all of their days. I'm going to give five points today. The first point is this. Consider your summary statement. Consider your summary statement. I think it's something we should think about. Even maybe something that you even want to write, write it down. It can be just a sentence or a paragraph, however you want to do it. And it's important to think, are my daily activities contributing to that summary statement? Are, the things, are there things that I would like to change about that summary statement? God wanted Israel to take Canaan. That was the larger goal or purpose of this generation. In that, they had to press forward one battle at a time. And with that larger goal, that summary statement, that can help us set some goals about what we're going to be doing next. Not too many. Not so drastic that they're unachievable. But it's good to have both physical and spiritual goals. And, and sometimes you can use maybe a physical goal to remind you of a spiritual goal. I'm doing this thing that's physical, but I, I know I need to do this, this thing that's spiritual, and vice versa. I've had a goal for this week that I didn't accomplish. <laughs> it's a goal that my, da my oldest daughter is really good at that I would also like to do. But this week was a fail because I had other goals that I had to do this week, like this sermon. <laughs> so tonight, tonight I will start that goal. So second point. Set short-term goals toward our long-term vision. Set short-term goals towards our long-term vision. Now let's turn to that story. Joshua 7, verse 1. And Mike discussed this story on the first day. He discussed it from the perspective of how sin impacts everybody. I'm going to look at 
this story a little bit different. Joshua 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up from there, from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off, cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? This battle of Ai represented the now what moment for this generation of Israelites. They had lost 36 men in this battle, a tragedy. But an even greater tragedy than that was what this loss represented. Was God still with them? If not, that was a very, very big problem. These people were up against a peoples that were superior, superior in all physical measures especially size and strength. And that's why the whole, the whole reason why the preceding generation refused to go. So they rightly recognized this lost battle at Ai was a very big problem. And their hearts melting because of this. Honestly, wouldn't we, our hearts melt at that as well? Well, one thing we don't see with them is we don't see this whining and complaining to Joshua that we saw with the preceding generation. What we instead see is Joshua coming before God in anguish. Why have you abandoned us? Point number three. Do not fold during tough times. Look to God. Do not fold during tough times. Look to God. As we create a roadmap for this year, this point should be central to how we proceed. We need to look to God. Things won't go as planned. That's just how life works. Some of our goals that we have right now, they will get blocked. And we'll need to call an audible in football speak. And as we adjust, we need to look to God. Not panic and not get distracted from our ultimate vision. Not to get distracted from where we want our summary statement to be. I think it's interesting that Israel would have just kind of re-baselined at this moment where they 
rebaselined at the days of unleavened bread. But here, they needed to kind of rebaseline again. It turned out that the reason God allowed the defeat was a sin, often known as the sin of Achan. And it's nice to think through these days, our lives are now in order, and we've conquered sin. But that is not how it works. These days are to help to have a heightened awareness of sin. But tonight at sunset, when this feast officially ends, we cannot turn off our sin awareness switch because of these, the forces of this world and even our own human nature will not stop. So point four, conquering sin is a continual battle. Conquering sin is a continual battle. The last point is going to get really dominate the rest of my message. And to to get there, I'm going to go a little bit on a tangent. But please bear with me. We will get there, and it will all kind of tie together in the end. And I'm going to play a game. I like to play games. I'm going to play kind of a guessing game. You don't have to yell it out loud. You can just write it down on paper if you you know the answer. But we're going to try to kind of play a name that character game. I'm going to give you some clues. First clue. This person, to me, is the second most important person in the Joshua account. Number two. This person is mentioned about 70 times in Scripture. He's mentioned about twice as much as Caleb. Samson and Gideon, people that kind of lived at the same time period. He's mentioned about half as much as Samuel and about a third as much of Joshua. This person is first mentioned in Exodus 6. This person is somebody that you'll think about him and you'll be like, there really weren't any stories about him in the Bible. <laughs> there are. They're just not highlighted stories. And part of the reason this person is mentioned so much is because of his important job function. So let's turn and read about this person at the very last verse of Joshua. Joshua 24, verse 33. You might think that Joshua is the person talked about in the very last verse of Joshua. Nope, it's this person. Joshua 24, verse 33. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died. They buried him in a hill belonging to Phinehas, his son, which was given to him in the mountains of Ephraim. So to me, this kind of emphasizes the importance of this character, Eliezer, who would have been Aaron's son. He would have been the second high priest of Israel. Now let's turn to Numbers 26, verse 63. This is the verse that triggered me to study this character, uh, Eliezer. Numbers 26, verse 63. These are those who were numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan, across from Jericho. But among these there was not a man of of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest, when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. So it was not left a man of them except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. 
So studying this character kind of gave me a new perspective of this time period in Joshua and what kind of the dynamics of the society. Here we see Eliezer performing a census along with Moses. And if you re go just a chapter ahead, you'll see, uh, I'm not going to read that story, you'll see Ele Eliezer again with Moses, Moses at the inauguration of Jonah, Joshua, when they're kind of setting him up as the new leader. So as high priest, this census, this inauguration of Joshua, his role kind of was an important part of the transition within Israel from becoming this nomadic nation to settling this new promised land. In doing this, Eliezer was clearly a leader as he was entering the promised land. What struck me was the statement about Joshua and Caleb be the, being the only ones numbered at the last census. And made me think, well, how old was Eliezer? Was he a young guy? Maybe. But there's other stories that would suggest otherwise. I, I said earlier that Exodus 6, he was mentioned. That's just a listing of Aaron's sons. So it, from that perspective, it's inconclusive what age he was. Or there are certain stories that you can kind of figure out what his age was. Because he was performing priestly functions in those stories. And we know in Numbers 4 that you had to be 30 years old to perform priestly functions. In Korah's Rebellion, which would have been about two chapters after this one, or, or the one in... Uh, it would have been about two, two chapters after the spies where, where they kind of get the whole congregation. Israel got this death penalty where they're going to be in the wilderness for the next 40 years. He was performing priestly functions in that story. But the story that's really telling is the story about Nadab and Abihu when they died. Because this one occurred in Leviticus 10. And it was also referenced early in Numbers, in Numbers 2. And he was, again, performing priestly functions. So he would have been at least 30 years old during, these, during this time. So is everything out of order in the Torah? Is that the answer? Well, I think there's another explanation. I'm going to read the original death sentence after this rebellion. And this is in Numbers 14, verse 29. You don't have to turn there. It's very similar to what we just read. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. And all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So it's very similarly worded, all who were numbered. Let's go back to that first census. Numbers 1, verse 47. Numbers 1, verse 47. But the Levites were not numbered among them by their father's tribe. For the Lord had spoken to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not number, nor take a census of them among the children of Israel. So the Levites were not numbered. And if you take the statements at face value, they wouldn't have been under the death sentence that God had kind of proclaimed against the rest of con the congregation. And this makes sense on a variety of different levels. The Levites weren't represented among the spies. 
The Levites weren't complicit in a lot of the other uh, sins of Israel. When Israel sinned at Mount Sinai, after that, uh, the golden calf incident, it says that the Levites stood with Moses. This also explains kind of the question I always had growing up as a teenager with Moses and Aaron. Because they weren't complaining during this whole situation. So it didn't seem right that they would have been lumped in in this. And, and later there's a story where, where they are denied entry into Canaan because they committed a sin then at Kadesh. So at that point, they wouldn't have been under this death sentence. It wasn't until Kadesh that they weren't allowed to enter into the promised land. So how does this change, I guess my perspective at least, of the, this time period? It gives us a, a better understanding of the rule of the priesthood, which Eliezer would have been included in during that time period. So you had Joshua and Caleb. These were elders and would have been pillars within that generation. But it, you also would have had the likes of Eliezer and perhaps other Levites that were pillars as well. In between this census and this coronation of Joshua that I already talked about, there is another story that Eliezer plays a role in. And it's the precursor to his most important function during his lifetime. Let's read that one. Numbers 27, verse 1. Numbers 27, verse 1. Then came the, da the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Mekir, the son of Manasseh, from the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these were the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Terza. And they stood before Moses, before Eliezer the priest, and before the leaders in all the congregation. But the door way of the tabernacle of meeting by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting saying our father died in the wilderness but he was not in the company of those who gathered together against the Lord in the company with Korah but he died in his own sin and he had no sons why should the name of our father be removed from among his family because he had no son give us a possession among our father's brothers so Moses brought their case before the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their father's brothers and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the relative closest to him in his family. And he shall possess it. And it shall be to the children of Israel a statute of judgment, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So here, Israel hadn't even crossed the Jordan yet, but the distribution of the land when they conquered it was really at the forefront of their minds. And it seems like a little bit of a trivial story, but honestly, if you think about this generation, claiming this land was the leg legacy of this generation. And it was God who gave the answer to this question, which signifies that it was important to him. In his response, God uses a word, uh, the Hebrew word, 
nakala, which is translated inheritance. He uses it six times. This word is important because it was a reminder that this was not just a possession. It was not just them taking this land from the nations. It was God's to give. And he had promised this land to Abraham. And them taking this land was a fulfillment of him giving it to them. It was their inheritance. This word, nakala, is used by far most in Numbers and Joshua throughout the Old Testament. It's used 46 times in Numbers and 50 times in Joshua. I think the next closest is Deuteronomy was like uh, 25 times. So it's a very important concept in these two chapters. Or these two books. Now let's turn to Joshua 14 verse 1. Joshua 14, verse 1. These are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest... Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed it as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and half tribe. So this is kind of the intro section to portioning off these lands, uh, these lands that were west of the Jordan. And the next six chapters are are pretty much long, boring parts of Scripture. It's just a lot of name listing uh, of, of various places. But it's interesting that Eliezer and Joshua are listed as leaders in executing this function. Because really, this would have been the culmination of the accomplishments of this generation. And this distribution of these lands would have affected Israel for as long as it listed, as long as it uh, was a nation. So it would have affected all the preceding or all the generations after. I think it's interesting that Eliezer is listed first among these that are performing this function. I think it's important because he was the religious leader. He was the high priest. I think part of that whole whole emphasis is God's role to play in this whole transfer of land or giving out the inheritance. And the lots also play into that because it was truly an inheritance that was being determined by God himself. Now let's turn to John, Joshua 19, verse 51. This is kind of the end of that six-chapter portion, and it, it's kind of wrapping up, wrapping up uh, the distribution of these lands. Joshua 19, verse 51. These were the inheritances which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided as an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So they made an end of dividing the country. So again, you see here that Eliezer is listed first. And again, that, that points to this being, yes, it being both a religious function as well as a political function, but the religious function took precedent. It was being done at Shiloh, at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Again, this being an emphasis in God's role in in giving out this inheritance. God giving out an inheritance is also a central theme in the New Testament. It's a major role of our high priest, Jesus Christ. 
this concept of inheritance was woven into Jesus' stories and his sayings. He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Several times Jesus is asked, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he was clearly addressing this same concept within his teachings. Let's turn to Hebrews 9, verse 13. Hebrews 9, verse 13. This kind of emphasizes what Jesus' sacrifice means for that inheritance. Hebrews 9, verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So Jesus' death redeems us from our transgressions, our sins, so that we may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Much like Israel, this inheritance we receive, it begins with a promise. It is God's to give, and he is anxious to give it to us. Unlike Israel, this one is an eternal inheritance. Because God's kingdom will last forever. Let's turn to 1 Peter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who according, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So it says this inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled. It will never fade away. This inheritance is a living hope founded on Jesus' resurrection, as we, as we heard in the sermon just this past Sabbath by Kurt. We will be raised just as Jesus Christ was raised. Let's turn to one final scripture in Revelation 21, verse 7. Revelation 21, verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will shall be my son. Our inheritance goes well beyond just land. But he who overcomes shall inherit all things. God wants us to have it all. So that we shall be called his son. What a spectacular vision for us all coming out of these days of unleavened bread. Fifth point. 
live life according to the vision of your eternal inheritance. Live life according to the vision of your eternal inheritance. We need to hold this vision. As the, we close out these eight days of Elam bread, we cannot be victim of this now what state. We need to learn from Israel's own now what moment in, in the story of Joshua. Because they were at the precipice of a monumental task. And before them was many challenges. But they overcame. And they fulfilled God's vision for them. And we have their summary statement. It says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Let's consider our own summary statement. Maybe even write it down. What needs to change in that summary statement? Still yet, even after these days of Elimbered. What would we still like to add to it or solidify even after these days of unlum bread? Let's establish realistic goals as stepping stones to get to that ultimate vision. Because challenges will come, we may need to redi redirect, we may re need to rebase line, and we may need to do that even before the next Holy Day season. We need to look to God, as Israel looked to God during the sin of Achan. Because it, that, that story is exiting the holy days just doesn't mean you haven't conquered sin at that point. There's more to do. So we need to remain vigilant in conquering sin. Lastly, and most importantly... We need to always remember our eternal inheritance. Conform our lives, our summary statement, our goals, our focus on that vision. Because it's God's to give. He is eager to give it. Just as he was in the days of Eliezer and Joshua when they were parsing out the inheritance to Israel. We must overcome so that we shall be called his sons, his daughters, and we shall inherit all things.